some of my approaches to taking pictures of birds. I don't know if we've got some bird photographers in the club, but hopefully everyone will find a few interesting tidbits from the talk regardless. So I'm just gonna get my screen share going here. So just bear with me for a second. We already tested it, so we know it works. Okay, so maybe you can give me a thumbs up if you see a hummingbird. Perfect, and you can hear me obviously, so we're good to go. So like I said, tonight we're gonna talk about bird photography simplified, which is kind of my approach to capturing images. I'm, I think it's just my nature, but I do tend to like deconstruct things and try to like, you know, figure out how to do them based on their component parts and try not to make things more difficult than they need to be. That's maybe kind of like just my approach to learning anything really. And bird photography is no exception. So tonight we'll talk about that. Basically, the, the plan here is we're going to, the first big part of the talk is talking about what I call these seven elements of a great bird photograph. It's really important if we're going to take great bird photos, we need to kind of know what we're, what we're trying to do. So it's good to deconstruct it and to look at some of these elements that would make up a really nice photo. And then we'll go into research and planning. So how I go ahead and prepare for a shoot some of my strategies in the field. We'll talk a bit about building a portfolio. I'm gonna to touch on the digital darkroom, but as you guys can imagine in a, the scope of a talk like this, I can't get hugely in depth in Photoshop and stuff, but I'll give you some concepts and some, some resources if you're interested in. And then we'll finish up with sharing your work and a little bit about equipment, and then we can do questions. Like uh, was said, if you have a, if, if while the talk's going on, you have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat. I've got it over here on my second monitor. So I, I might see it. If I do, I'll try to answer it if it's sort of in context. And if, if I miss it, we'll just bring it up at the end of the talk. Oh, one other thing. Um, throughout the talk, there's a few times when I throw questions out to you guys. And so you'll have, it's like everyone's muted right now. So you'll have to hit your space bar or you can type your answer into the chat. So let's try that right now. Seven elements of a great bird photograph. What do you guys think some of those elements might be? Composition. Excellent. Eye contact. Yeah, it looks like Brian had the same idea there, getting eye contact. Color. Color, yeah, that's that can be really important, although, you could probably do a really cool black and white bird photo too, but not the norm. Someone wrote depth of field in the, in the chat. What are some other fundamental things? We'll give it a few more seconds and I'll show you my list. Background. Good, excellent. That is all my list. Ideally, ideally you would show uh, um, some kind of typical behavior. Yeah, that's we're definitely going to get into that. Uh, Ryan put in clarity, which which is a good a good word, and another word that people often use probably would be like sharpness, like sharp photo. Maybe that's also in the same category. Let's put up my list. You guys got some of them. It's funny. Almost I've given I've given this talk probably like forty times now. Nobody almost ever says exposure because it's so obvious. You know, like that you know your photo needs to be exposed properly but it does need to be exposed properly you know you could do all these other things but if you totally botch the exposure it's not going to be a great photo the light the lighting in the image is so important we all know how important light is light is everything when it comes to photography you could do everything else right but if you have horrible harsh light you're probably not going to create a great photo composition was mentioned sharpness was mentioned the perch is really important for a bird photo. Of course, it could be a flight shot or something else like that. But in, in many cases, we're talking about birds in their natural environment. And the perch is really important. The background is really important. And the, I put the pose. Somebody talked about eye contact. I'm going to put that in with the pose because that kind of goes hand in hand with that. So we're going to talk about all these now. And then we're going to talk about what I call the X factor, which is something extra, perhaps like somebody mentioned, some kind of behavior. There's a lot of things that could be an X factor. We'll talk about those a little later on. Okay, so exposure. Obviously, I'm going into this knowing nothing about your club, assuming that most of you are probably quite experienced photographers, but maybe somebody new joined the club tonight. It's obviously super important that we, in order to create a properly exposed image, 
we need to understand these critical three variables in our camera. And those are, of course, the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. We have to know how to control our camera to change those settings in order to create a properly exposed image. How to use all three of those things together to achieve our goals, depending on what those goals are. One thing I find that can really trip people up if they're new to photography or maybe new to bird photography is just that understanding that the way our eyes see the scene, it's not necessarily the same way that the camera and the camera's meter sees the scene. So here's kind of what I mean. This is very oversimplified example, but imagine we have a very black bird, a medium toned bird and a very white bird, and they're all on a kind of neutral toned background and the bird is large in the frame. The camera's meter is always trying to average out the scene. So the black bird might wind up actually moving a bit towards the middle and being a bit washed out. The medium toned bird, medium toned background, gonna be just fine. And the white bird might wind up looking kind of a little bit light gray. You guys will be familiar with this. I know winter has passed, but if you've ever gone and tried to take a nice snowy landscape scene, you take a picture at the metered reading, what does it look like? It doesn't look glistening beautiful white, does it? It looks light gray. So you have to add light in order to have the white truly show as white because the camera's meter is trying to average the scene. So same with the birds. You might have to take away light from the blackbird, Medium tone bird will be fine. White bird, you might have to add light. Like I said, very oversimplified, but just to get you starting to think that you have to sometimes give the camera some input based on what you're looking at. One of the things, you know, I didn't mention this, but throughout the year normally, not unfortunately during this era that we're living in right now, but normally I travel mostly for my photography and I lead photo tours all over South America. And one of the things I always try to tell my clients in the field in order to keep things simple is always try to balance the light on the subject and the background. So if you have a bird that's in sun, try to find a sunny background. If you have a bird that's in the shade, try to find a shady background. That makes our exposure decisions so much easier. So here's kind of what I'm talking about. On the right is a situation that happens all the time. Some exciting bird flies in and everyone just starts immediately taking pictures of it, not paying attention to their background. If you took a picture here at the metered reading, you would wind up with a silhouette. Those white clouds would totally throw off the exposure. So you'd crank your exposure compensation to the right and you'd wind up with this really high key image, blown out background, some detail on the bird, but probably not really that compelling of an image. Instead, what I tell people to do is look past your subject to the background. Do you have a good background? Do you have a balanced background? And then move according to that. So in this case, we move to the left, we line the bird, which is in the shade, up with the background trees that are also in the cloudy light. I shouldn't say shade, I should say cloudy conditions, flat light. And all of a sudden we have a really balanced exposure and probably a much more pleasing image. When I started taking pictures, despite my youthful appearance, it was the days of slide film and film cameras. Um, it was a lot harder to get good images and exposures, especially because I was just starting out. These days we have this incredible tool on our cameras, which is of course the histogram. The histogram is by far the most important piece of information on your digital camera. And it's essential that you understand what the histogram is and how to, how to use that information to create a properly exposed image. The rule that I always tell people in the field is you can really, again, remember the name of the talk is Bird Photography Simplified. You can simplify your life by just remembering this one rule, which is always exposed to the right. What do I mean by exposed to the right? Well, let's look at a histogram. Move my head out of the way. So here we have a histogram. And just as a refresher, or in case we have any new photographers with us tonight, this side of the histogram where my finger is, is basically as white as white can be. And over on the other side over there is black. And the histogram is just graphically showing us the parts of the image or the, the percentage of the image that's in these various tonal ranges. The shape of the histogram, completely irrelevant, doesn't matter at all. But if you wanna create consistently properly exposed digital images, the best thing to do is what, what I say, exposed to the right. 
And what I mean by that is that you have some part of your histogram coming down into this final, you know, let's say 10% of the histogram. If you have some little tail or some part of your histogram coming into that final 10%, you're gonna have a, a, a properly, perfectly exposed image. And that's gonna give you the most digital data to deal with in your raw file. Now, that's not to say that that image will look perfect out of the camera. In fact, if you've shot the image in flat um, light, like really cloudy light, it probably will look kind of washed out. You will have to darken the blacks. You will have to add contrast to the image. But it's much easier to do that than to have to push the exposure in the digital darkroom. That tends to introduce noise and degrade the file quality. So the easiest thing to remember is use your histogram, expose to the right, and you'll be off to the races. Now, it'd be amazing if that was all there was to it. You could just say, hey, Glenn told us to expose to the right. All my images are going to be spectacular. Not so fast. We all know that, you know, some birds, some scenarios, they require ideal conditions, right? So, for example, imagine this image here. Imagine if I had taken this image of a harlequin duck on a really dreary, cloudy day. It's not going to look like this, is it? Even if I do everything perfect technically, exposed to the right, everything, doesn't matter. The water, it's not going to be blue. The bird iridescent on the back of his head, nope, not going to see that either. And the detail in the blacks, as well as the whites and having that soft light to actually capture that, probably not going to be able to do that either. You know, there's no way to create this image on a really, on a cloudy day. So certain certain photos just require, you know, ideal or, or certain conditions. One of the things that bothers me, um, sometimes I'll see other photography instructors or whatever, just people in the field acting like they're kind of like superior because they shoot in manual mode. And I think that's, that's fine. That's great. If that works for you and, and you're able to consistently create properly exposed images, wonderful, that's great, keep doing that. But there's no hierarchy here. If you shoot in aperture priority mode most of the time, shutter speed priority most of the time, program mode most of the time, it doesn't matter. Whatever works for you, whatever makes sense to your brain, whatever allows you to control those critical variables, ISO, shutter speed, aperture, or exposure compensation, in order to create properly exposed images, use that, that's great. I probably shoot 90% of the time in aperture priority mode. And when it's advantageous to me, I'll switch and shoot manual mode. But that's not the right way to do things. That's just what makes sense to me. And that's kind of how I've learned to do things. So don't let anyone tell you that if you don't shoot manual mode all the time, you're not a good photographer. That is garbage. However, there's sometimes, it sure makes sense. Actually, this morning I went out, it was a beautiful day here, and I was doing some flight photography. and this image is not from this morning, but it was a very similar scenario. I was trying to photograph ducks in flight. They were on a quite a variable background. So they could have gone up against the sky, they could have gone against the trees, they could have gone against the water. If I was shooting this in aperture priority, it would be a really bad strategy because if that bird went up against the sky, it would totally change the exposure. And there's simply no way that I could track a fast flying bird and be changing my exposure compensation. It's not possible and it's definitely not a good strategy. Instead, what I would do in this scenario and certainly what I did this morning, this morning is actually a perfect example. So this morning, I just saw a Canada goose really close by. So the goose was in the same light that I was gonna be shooting in. So I took a few pictures of him. I metered off of him. I made sure I wasn't blowing out any of the white parts on the Canada goose, lock those settings in and then blast away. I don't have to overthink it then. I can just lock those settings in and do what we call spray and pray. Take lots of pictures, fingers crossed you get one good one. But you definitely don't want to be shooting aperture priority in for flight photography against a variable background. That's not going to be a good strategy. Okay, let's move on to our second element, which is light. Photography is the art of capturing light. I don't care if you're doing landscapes, macro, birds, people, it's all about light. We have to learn to see light as photographers. We have to learn to understand that light has quality, 
light has direction, light has intensity, light has color, all of these things that are going to determine ultimately the types of images we get. When I'm shooting in direct sunlight, like I was this morning, one of the rules that I like to use is to look down at my shadow. And if my shadow is nice and long, I know I have good quality light to work with. But if my shadow gets shorter than I am tall, so I'm about six feet tall, if my shadow's gotten shorter than six feet, pack it up, put the camera gear away, go take a break, because you're never going to create great images in that kind of harsh light. So that's a little trick that I like to use in the field. Now, it'd be amazing if we could always shoot in this beautiful golden light. This is a Hudsonian godwit from way up in the tundra. And here's a bar-tailed godwit from up in Alaska. This was taken at like one in the morning, right around the solstice. Just beautiful, amazing light. We would all love to shoot in this light all the time. That'd be great. Not possible though, is it? Most of my photography is done in the tropical Andes mountains. If I waited around all day for that kind of light, I'd be waiting a long time. There's a bit of a problem. We've got some fairly large mountains in our way, obstructing the light almost all of the time. A lot of the times, by the time the sun even clears the mountain ridge, it's already getting harsh. So when I go shooting anywhere away from home, I'm praying for clouds. I'm happy if it's cloudy every day I'm in South America. It gives me so much more time to be productive in the field. I can shoot all day. And more important than that even is I don't have to worry about angles. The worst scenario for me is when I'm on a, a mountain. So I have to deal with slope and directional light. That means that probably 75% of the time, the light angle is not gonna work for me. It's so frustrating. So I would way rather have cloudy conditions anytime I'm away from home. Now those photos will require more post-processing. Obviously the shot I just showed you, like those ones of the Godwits, basically no post-processing required if you expose them properly, like convert raw file, done. In flat light, you're definitely gonna have to do more post-processing, but it's no big deal once you learn how to do it. And you certainly have more opportunities shooting in flat light. So here's a little example. This is a horned grebe. And you look at this photo and it looks, looks all right, but you wouldn't really know that that's what the raw photo looked like. Super drab, not appealing at all. I did do the right thing and expose to the right. If I had pushed it any further, I would have been blowing out his little, his little horns. This is a horned grebe, but it just was very end of the day, dark overcast conditions, not a good really day to be out shooting. But even then you can still pull something out with good post-processing. Okay, we've talked about direct sunlight. We've talked about cloudy light. I think we should talk about one more type of light, which is artificial light. And by this, I mean the use of flash. Flash can be really useful as a nature photographer, but you absolutely have to learn how to control the power. You need to know how to decide how much is enough and how much is too much. And you really want to get that flash out of the hot shoe up off camera in order for it to look more natural. Basically in the field, you're going to encounter one of these three settings or, you know, some variation in between. Let's start from the left. The first on the left is, is the conditions that I just told you guys I like so much. A nice cloudy day. The sloth is in flat light. The background, flat light. All we need is a little kiss of fill flash to give them a catch light in the eye. The directional light from the flash provides a little bit of micro contrast in the fur or the feathers. And maybe it fills in a little bit of the darker shadows, but certainly doesn't eliminate the shadows. That's what we want to avoid. So that's a great scenario to use a little kiss of fill flash. In the second example, even though, as I told you, we're always trying to balance the light out, we had the subject in the shade and we couldn't find a shady background. We had a sunny background. So the only way that we're going to be able to balance the exposure out between the background and the subject is to hit the subject with a bunch of flash. It's not ideal for a couple of reasons. One, it's probably not gonna look very good. And two, there's definitely some ethical considerations when it comes to using heavy doses of fill flash. So definitely not my favorite example. On the farthest example to the right, we have the opposite where we have the subject in the sun and we couldn't find a sunny background. So here, of course, flash is not gonna help us at all because 
if we put out so much flash that it hits the background, it's also going to hit the subject and it's not going to work to balance our exposure. So instead, we'd switch the flash off, we would meter properly for the sloth and the branch, and we would let the background go quite dark. And it could be a really great moody looking shot. Final thing we want to talk about with flash is just this idea that there's kind of two main modes that we'd be likely to use. One is ETTL, and that stands for electronic through the lens. And the other one is manual mode. Most of the time in the field, we're going to be using TTL or ETTL flash. But it's good to know about manual as well, because it can open up some creative opportunities. And occasionally, we want to override the, the camera's flash or the camera's flash metering decisions, I should say. So here's a quick little illustration of kind of the difference between TTL and manual. In TTL flash, what happens is the flash sends out a little pre-flash, it bounces off the subject, it bounces back through the lens, the camera then and the camera's meter then decides how much flash to actually put out. So it's smart, it knows what you're pointing at, it knows how far the subject is away, it knows if it's white, black, how shiny it is, all that stuff. And if the subject moves, like for example, in this example, it's moved further away, the camera knows that as well because it has that pre-flash to meter off of. So it then just ups the power and you're all good. Manual flash is not smart like that. You have to dial in the power and it will put out that power. So it's very difficult to use manual flash in the field in an example like this. To be experienced enough to know exactly the right power to use, not that many people can do that first time out of the gate. So you're more likely in the field to use TTL or ETTL flash. Okay, let's move on to composition. For me, composition is one of those funny words that it, I don't like the word. It doesn't resonate with me. When I think of composition, the word that I think actually sums up what composition is all about is balance. I think of composition as a, a good composition is a well-balanced image. Another word that I like to use is a harmonious image. All the elements look pleasing together, the background, the subject, the perch. That's what I think of when I think of good composition. Now, there's certainly some rules when it comes to composition. Um, you know, as a rule, we tend to leave more space in front of the subject. Certainly the rule of thirds we've all heard of. There's a few different rules. One of the things I find that sometimes people forget when they get into bird photography is that they can actually turn their camera and shoot vertically or in a portrait mode. And this really makes a lot of sense for a lot of birds. Um, for example, imagine like a woodpecker or a hummingbird or a penguin. These birds are definitely gonna lend themselves more to a vertical composition. So good to remember. Another thing that's worth considering is these days, we, we tend to all have quite a lot of megapixels. Uh, my new camera has 45 megapixels. I do not need to fill the frame with every single pixel. Leave a little bit of space so that you can crop for composition in the digital darkroom. That's much easier to do rather than when you have the opportunity. Now, of course, most of the time with birds, they're small and we, by default, leave some space for cropping but maybe you're at like a little duck pond or something where they're coming in close. Just remember one, one trick, I, I didn't actually put this in the slide, but one trick that I always tell people when we're photographing waterfowl is I'll say, draw an imaginary box out in the pond at the right distance that gives you a good size in the frame and right on your good light angle. Put like a little imaginary box out there in your mind and only focus on the ducks that swim through there. Forget the ones that are closer, forget the ones that are further, forget the ones that are off your light angle, focus in your box and you'll, you'll get better shots. So things like that to consider. There's ultimately infinite possibilities when it comes to composition. So I'm not gonna show you a whole heap of photos here. I'll show you a couple. This is a Ross's gull from way up in the high Arctic. And this is just a very standard composition. Bird looking into the open space, kind of looking down into the open space, and maybe that hint of a reflection and the fog coming up off the ice is just helping to balance the top and bottom of the image a little bit, but certainly nothing super special here, just a standard composition. The bird is special, composition, standard. This image I put in just to show 
the idea that it's not just the bird and the main perch, but it's everything that's in the photo that helps to balance it. So for me, this image of an evening grosbeak is really balanced out by that upper little sprig there. That really helps to balance the, the, the frame, I think. We'll see some more examples of that later. Okay, on to our next element, sharpness. We all know that when it comes to photos of animals, whether they're people or monkeys or birds, it's really important that the eye is in focus. Now there's some reasons for that. Like when you look at an image, a wildlife image, you wanna feel that connection. Like you're looking at the subject and it's looking back at you. If the eye is not in focus, you're not gonna feel like that. So it's gonna to have to be something pretty special or pretty artistic for you to get away with it if the eye is not in focus. Those are some things that we could do to help us take a sharp photo. And now is another time, I'm gonna throw it out to you guys. What do you think could help us take a sharp photo? Tripod. Tripod, excellent. What about if I'm using my big 600 millimeter lens and it's getting a little dark? There we go, Ryan, shutter speed. Give it another couple seconds. Anyone else got any ideas? Those are probably two of the main ones. All right, let's put up my list. So first one, of course, are you stable? Because ultimately the sharpness of our image is gonna depend upon subject movement, us, and, or sorry, let me rephrase that. Camera movement, us, and subject movement, the bird. So we can control our movement by being on a tripod or by using really good technique if we're not on a tripod. Also image stabilization or vibration reduction is certainly helpful. Having a really good quality lens is helpful. And note that I put here shutter speed adequate because it's, it's not fast shutter speed because it depends on what's going on. Are we on a tripod? Are we really stable? Is the bird just sitting there not doing anything? We can get away with a slower shutter speed. Are we trying to photograph a hummingbird that's in natural light flying and we wanna freeze the wings while it's feeding at a flower? Well, of course, we're gonna need a very fast shutter speed for that. So it just depends on what we're trying to capture. Some other things, today I was shooting and at first it was really nice, and I was hand holding because I was doing flight shooting and then the wind picked up and I was, I was immediately like, oh, my talk, this is a valid point. The wind was shaking my lens all over the place and it was much, much more difficult once that wind kicked up. Um, if we're at a slow shutter speed, the mirror flipping up in our camera, if we're still using a mirrored camera can be a problem. And heat haze can be so frustrating when you encounter heat haze in the field because there's really nothing you can do about it. The final point here is that um, sharpness, obviously it's important. It's one of our seven elements, but it's not one element of a great bird photo. Sometimes I'll see people and they're so excited about their sharp bird photo that's sitting on a chain link fence with a truck in the background, poorly exposed and poorly composed. And I'm like, well, you got one out of seven. So just remember, it's only one. I put this slide in just to show a technique that I use with my tripod and gimbal head, where I like to just put my hand on the side of the gimbal head and then I use my fingers to pinch the gimbal and I find that it's so stable and secure. Conventional literature would have you putting your arm out on the lens, but, and that's great, that works, but try standing like that for a few hours and then tell me how you do the next day after your chiropractic visit because your back is not gonna be feeling great if you do that. So this is more stable and a lot more comfortable. The other thing worth noting here is remember in flash, I mentioned that we wanna get that flash up and off camera. So here you see how I've done that. I've got a flash bracket and the flash is like, really like at least 10 inches probably above what it would have been in the hot shoot. The reason why this is so important is A, it makes it look more natural, like it's coming from a higher perspective, but even more important than that, with birds, if you leave the flash in the hot shoe, or worse, you use the pop-up little flash, you're going to wind up with what's called steel eye. When you take the picture, there's going to be a reflection from the bird's eye that looks like silver. Humans, we get red eye, but birds, for whatever reason, they get steel eye. It doesn't look very good in your photos. 
If you get a flash bracket, no more steely. So definitely a good thing to do. Okay, next element, the perch. The perch, I said here, it takes an image to the next level. And for me as a serious bird photographer, the perch is almost as important as the bird. If I get a, if I get a otherwise great photo of a bird, but it's on this super boring or ugly perch, it just kills the photo for me. It just makes it like I'm going home just like, oh, why couldn't he have landed on something nicer? It's really important. So what makes a good perch? Well, the perch should be an appropriate size. So obviously, you know, a little warbler versus a raven, gonna be a pretty different size perch that would be appropriate. The perch should be visually interesting to us, should be appealing. Now that could come in a number of forms. The perch could be just some cool bark, maybe like even like a crack in the branch. Maybe it's got some lichens on it or some interesting leaves. Um, there's a lot of options, of course, but something that's visually appealing. Even to the next level, maybe the perch tells us something about where the bird lives or how the bird lives. The perch can give us a lot of natural history clues into the, the world of the subject, the world of the bird, if we if we're careful about it. And as we've seen already, and we'll see in a second here, the perch can be a strong compositional aid. We saw that in the evening grosbeak. The perch can help us with our composition or hurt us with our composition. So let's look at some examples. Here we have a beautiful species of jay from, this one's down in Bolivia. And the reason I put this, this photo in was, it shows obviously that this bird lives in quite a lush and rainforesty environment with all that moss. But really, I love this shot because of that upper branch that really helps to frame the shot out. And to me, without that upper branch, this photo would be nowhere near as good. I think there's a, a what I'm gonna call a misconception in bird photography that the, the holy grail, the pinnacle of bird photography is a bird on a stick with a blurred out green background. That that's, that's the best type of bird photography and the only type of bird photography. And I really disagree. Um, I take lots of those photos. I certainly enjoy those photos. They're great because the bird pops off the background. You can really appreciate all the details of the bird and there's really no distractions. They're great shots to have in a portfolio but it's certainly not the only types of photos that I wanna to try to take. The problem with those images is, to me, they look a little bit sterile, a little bit clinical. They look a little bit removed from nature. And I kind of consider myself to be a nature photographer. So while I like having those images in my portfolio, I, I would not want my entire portfolio to just be bird on a stick, blurred out green background. To me, that would be quite boring and very one dimensional. So images like this are what I would call perfectly imperfect in nature. Nature is not perfect. Nature has rips in the leaves and brown leaves and things in the background. Nature is not perfect, but nature sure is beautiful. And when you can harness some of that in a photo, to me, those are actually a higher standard of wildlife image. So this is a long-tailed silky flycatcher from Costa Rica. And he's got a bunch of berries and things in the background. And I think they look pretty nice. But like I said, there's nothing wrong with a green background. The reason I put this one in is uh, mostly actually just for those extra elements that are in the frame. Those leaves being there really helps to frame this shot, doesn't it? Um, this is a black-throated gray warbler. This is a Canada warbler, more from your guys' side of the continent. And the reason I put this one in, of course, it also exhibits that second element in the composition with that branch in the upper part. But Canada warblers breed mostly in very moist kind of coniferous forests. And this is a tamarack. Of course, you guys probably rec probably recognize it. And they grow in moist, you know, coniferous areas. So it's, it's a perfect perch for this bird on its breeding territory. So from a natural history perspective, the perch is telling us a lot, even if that's subliminally. Sometimes we can control what the birds land on. This is a swallow-tailed hummingbird from Brazil. And hummingbirds are very habitual about their perches. Maybe you guys have ruby-throated hummingbirds coming to your backyard. I don't know, are they back yet? 
Have they started coming back yet? Not yet. Another couple of weeks, maybe. Or some people are saying yes. So they're, they're starting to come back. You might notice that sometimes in your backyard, they keep going back to the same branch. If it's somewhere that you can access, you could set a nice little branch there and he might land right where you want him. That's what happened here. This guy kept going back to the same spot, but unfortunately it was like a rusted piece of steel sticking out of the ground, not a Glen Bartley approved perch. However, when I strapped this little beautiful lichen covered perch onto the top of his rusted piece of steel, he was very happy to land there instead. And I was happy to take his photo. The next couple of examples are just more of these perfectly imperfect nature, his natural history shots. So yes, there's a few things in the background. Yes, the leaves have some rips in them. Yes, all of the berries kind of look a little disheveled. No further comment. <laughs> Same here. This is a scarlet-bellied mountain tanager and he's looking in a very natural setting. And, you know, I think you guys get what I'm trying to get at, that it doesn't have to be this super sterile, clean image every single photo. I take lots of pictures like that. I like those pictures, but I don't want to take only those pictures. This is a, another one of those examples like the Canada warbler where this perch is perfectly appropriate for the natural history of this bird. This is an Ecuadorian hill star. They live high, high, high up in the mountains in Ecuador, up to 5,000 meters above sea level. So that's like 17,000 feet. Amazing high elevation hummingbirds. And they pretty much only feed at these chugirawa flowers. It's a flowering shrub. So this is the, like the ideal perch for this bird, which is you know just a spectacular combination. Even if I remember from art class, I believe orange and purple are, what is it, complementary or some kind of colors across the wheel. So you could even throw that in there if you wanted. This is a fork-tailed flycatcher, and it, it could have been kind of a boring shot if I zoomed in really tight. But because this bird has such a long tail and he's kind of taking up a lot of space up there, the perch with all those leaves down in the bottom really, I think, helps to kind of balance the shot out. And, and I think it makes quite an interesting composition, giving you more to look at with it being a little bit looser in the frame. Some birds, the last one and this one, they have these like crazy long tails and they can be really challenging to compose for because imagine for example if this branch was running perfectly straight across you'd wind up with all this negative space all around the bird and it doesn't look right in this case again this guy kept going back to the same spot i just tilted his branch a little bit and then the composition works a lot better the diagonal the strong diagonal the bird looking out into the kind of open space down into the left it really works much better anyways just some examples of perches sky's the limit, but it is an important aspect of a really nice bird photo. I'm just checking my chat here. Jeff has asked that uh, the images are very sharp with a lot of clarity. What shutter speed do you strive for to reduce any movement and retain sharpness? Well, like I said, it all depends upon those critical variables, both my stability, and I'm comfortable that if I'm on a tripod, I can take a sharp photo down to like a 15th of a second if the bird is perfectly still. But if the bird is, I'm always gauging how active is the bird. So if the bird is really not moving, then I'd be willing to go down as low as a 15th, although that's very low. I would rather keep it above like a 60th and ideally more like a 250th of a second. If the bird is more active, then we're gonna have to go up and up and up all the way up to today. I was trying to photograph green winged teals which fly very fast, very difficult, and you need a fast shutter speed. So I was trying to keep my shutter speed above a 2,000th of a second in order to have any chance of, of capturing a sharp image of that. So just depends on the movement. Okay, so the background is our next element. And I said here the background, at the very least, the background should not distract from the photo. So that's where we get into a nice blurred out green background, totally works. Nothing wrong with those photos. I don't want you guys telling everybody that Glenn said he hates green backgrounds. That's not what I'm saying. But that's the baseline of like a standard shot. And better yet, the background and the setting and the context adds to our photo, okay? So let's look at some examples. So here we have the standard green background, 
even maybe you could say that the background goes kind of from orangey to green, just like the bird goes kind of from orangey to green. Uh, this is a chestnut breasted coronet hummingbird down in Ecuador. This is a buff tailed coronet, that other guy's cousin. And he was in the understory. So I kind of wanted the background to be kind of dark, a little bit dark anyways, and have a similar color palette to the bird and the perch and the flower. Now here we're getting more what I like. This is a strong build wood creeper and he lives in the cloud forest, a very lush, amazing habitat. Plants are growing off of everything down there. The concrete, people's cars, the hydro lines, plants are growing everywhere. And that's why there's so, such diversity and such incredible birds like this. So I want, I want the image to convey that this is a lush, rich tropical environment. And I do think this image does that. Again, perfectly imperfect nature. Some would say, oh, so distracting with all those needles in the background, pine needles, yuck. But this little guy, this little warbler only lives in the Caribbean in mature pine forests, the only place he lives. So I kind of want to make it look like it's a pine forest. You get the idea. Sometimes the background becomes the star of the show. So here I was up in the tundra, this beautiful wimbrel, and the spectacular color palette when the tundra comes into the bloom, into bloom. So really wouldn't matter what bird you put here, it's gonna be a beautiful shot with that background. Usually with bird photography, the bird is quite large in the frame, but sometimes we get an opportunity to create what I would call like a bird scape. Here, I've got a black-bellied plover. I'm way up in Alaska, and I wanted to give a sense of where these birds are flying thousands and thousands of kilometers to get up to their breeding grounds and to show people who wouldn't maybe get a chance to go there, what, what are they, where are they going? Like, what does it look like where they breed? And this is in July. Like, there's snow, you know, 20 meters higher than where these birds are. It's pretty amazing the limits they go to to find a little patch of tundra and to make a few more little baby plovers. And this is similar, right? Uh, a really nice habitat shot of this white-tailed ptarmigan showing where it lives up in the alpine environment. It's, uh, it's a really nice thing to do when you get the opportunity to put the bird in its environment. It's not that easy though, because of course you need a wider lens, so you're gonna have to get closer to your subject and more and more, it's just hard to find a wide angle shot that doesn't have a road or a hydro wire or some people or somebody's truck or something in the background. So when you see the opportunity, take it, but it's not that easy. Okay, our last essential element is the pose. And like I said before, with wildlife photography, we need to feel like we have that connection to the species. We need to feel like the subject is looking us in the eye. And in order for that, we need a little bit of a head turn towards us in our pose. Another thing we need is ideally, we want to be at eye level with the subject. So if it's a little shorebird or a little duck swimming on a pond, where do you need to be? On your belly. You need to get that low perspective. Um, that's gonna make the image a lot more engaging. And it's also gonna help you a lot with your background, but most importantly, it's gonna really, you're gonna feel that intimacy in the shot, like you're looking right into the eyes. Other thing with the pose, maybe the birds, some birds have like a really classic pose or maybe like a really dynamic pose they might be doing. Those could be quite interesting as well. So here, for example, we've got a red-breasted sapsucker. And look at this pose. The bird is called the red-breasted sapsucker. And look at this pose, puffing out his chest, looking proud, and turning his eye towards us. Look at the photo. Do you feel like you're looking the bird in the eyes? Do you feel like he's looking at you? I think so. So that's good. That's what we're going for. I can't take any credit for the pose here because of course hummingbirds beat their wings incredibly fast, but it sure was a lucky uh, coincidence that the wings were nicely back, kind of mirroring the leaves up in the top, balancing the composition. Imagine this shot if the wings were totally forwards not a very balanced composition, would it? Everything would be on the one side of the shot. I would have had to crop it totally differently or probably just wouldn't be as appealing. 
you might look at this fiery throated hummingbird and think, wow, he's got a really nice red throat. And he sure does. When he turns exactly the right way, the pose was critical to this shot. You guys know nuthatches. This is pretty classic nuthatch pose, isn't it? Coming down the trunk of the tree, kind of checked up like that. It's a, it's a really classic, classic nuthatch pose. And sometimes birds give us a really dynamic pose. This is a Cuban trogon, and another trogon had flown into this guy's neck of the woods, and he didn't like it. He got angry. I was standing behind my camera, and I pushed the button. Okay, so that gets us through our seven elements. So that gives us a good idea of what we're trying to create as a kind of good baseline. All those elements, you put all those elements into a bird photo, you're gonna be well on your way to taking a great shot. However, there's more we can do. Something I like to call the X factor or you know, just something special. These are the types of photos that when you went out, you came home, you look at your photo and you feel really happy. You were really happy you got to see that. You're really excited about it. What do you guys think are some possibilities for X factor photos? An unexpected behavior on the part of the bird. Definitely, definitely. Norman says feeding, absolutely. Ingrid says birds catching prey, absolutely. Breeding, for sure. Those are good ones. Feeding each other, yeah. Rain, good rain or fog, something environmental that takes it out of the ordinary. I love that one, Ellen. Those are all great ones. I'll give you a couple more seconds if anyone wants to chime in. Okay. You guys got some of, definitely like most of the ones on my list. The truth is it could be anything that makes it feel a little special. So I put down with prey, any kind of behavior, any kind of action, maybe calling, maybe with babies, somebody put hatching. So any kind of natural history moment, life, life moment between individuals. Uh, I love Ellen's there and kind of similar to what I put there, extreme weather, something contextual. Any of these things could make the photo a little special. So let's look at some examples. This was something I really wanted to capture, which was hummingbirds bathing. It's not that easy in a natural context out in a little rainforest stream in Costa Rica. This took me about five days sitting down by the stream to get a good photo of a bird actually like showing that they're, you know, bathing. So I'm really happy to have that one in my collection. Any kind of action. So we've got a beautiful red and green macaw just banking in the light in the, in the lowlands in Peru. Just a spectacular bird showing off his spectacular plumage. Courtship behavior. So we've got a, col a common golden eye and he's doing his little display trying to impress the ladies. Also guys note, remember we talked about being at eye level. I think you can get the idea that I was definitely on my belly here. Um, a lot of the times with waterfowl, I'll get in the water, uh, put on chest waders like for fly fishing and I'll get right in there. I realize not everyone is as uh, crazy as I am to do that. I don't expect you to be, but trying, always trying to get at eye level is always worth doing. Feeding again, we've got an acorn woodpecker with an acorn, so that kind of works. And here we have a little more extreme, um, extreme example with the Merlin who's caught a dowager. And here we've got a little wood creeper and he's caught a lizard. So again, some more predation. This is a pretty cool shot of a displaying golden crown kinglet, just really, you know, got his crest up and he's calling. And if we if we take a minute just to drive home the point of our seven elements, you know, we've got the exposure right. We had some nice soft lighting. We have a nice composition. We've got a very nice appropriate perch. These birds are almost always in coniferous areas. We've got a nice background that's not just blurred out green. It's got that nice feathery texture to the coniferous leaves. We've got a nice pose and the eye is sharp. So you see how it all starts to come together. Our X factor could be something different. So here we have a very unusual bird for sure. This is a red-billed scythe bill with that crazy bill. It's in Brazil, but also a different technique. So I've chosen to go for a very high key or a silhouetted image here. And I think it really shows off this bird quite well. Something different, again, could be a different technique. I had already gotten a nice photo of the red and green macaw, 
So I thought, let's try something different. Why don't I really slow down my shutter speed? And um, so I stopped the lens down. I dropped the ISO so that I could get a slower shutter speed. And I tried to pan at the same time as the bird was flying. That allowed the eye and the head to still be relatively in focus. And yet I get that streaking background and a bit of movement in the wings. So just, you know, something a little different. Ellen, this one's for you, some special weather. So we've got some nice snow falling. And I really think that that takes this image to the next level of this adult king penguin looking out over all the babies. The snow really adds to the shot. Everybody loves baby ducks, full stop. Again, a different technique. So I love photographing hummingbirds and I am not above making a plug for my forthcoming book, which will be out this fall. It's a coffee table book with Princeton University Press and BirdLife International, and it's all about hummingbirds. So if you're looking for a Christmas present for somebody later this year, there you go. When I photograph hummingbirds, you know, a lot of them live down in the cloud forest in South America. And as you could probably guess, it's cloudy there most of the time, which means there's no way we're going to get this kind of image with natural light. We have to use flash in order, not all the time, but many, it certainly, let's put it this way, it certainly allows me to be a lot more consistent if I know how to use flash to freeze the motion and to light the scene. So for this, I'm lighting the entire scene with flash, very low power, so that the birds don't even notice it, but it's only the flash that's recorded in the image. And that flash is pulsing for such a brief duration. We're talking about a 16 thousandth of a second that the flash pulses for. You barely even notice it, but it provides all the light in the scene. It's lighting the bird, it's lighting the perch, it's lighting the background, and it's only that 16 thousandth of a second that's recorded in the photo. So that allows me, even in dark, dreary conditions in the cloud forest, to still photograph hummingbirds like this. So pretty nice trick to have up your sleeve. Okay, so we made it through part one, which is all about uh, our seven elements and our X factor. Now we kind of know what we're trying to create. So now we're going to talk about how to do it. So for me, what I certainly don't do is think, well, today I'm just going to go out walking in the forest and maybe I'll see some birds. No. When I go out shooting, I have a plan. I've done my research. I usually am going out for a particular species. And let's, let's take a look at how this all plays out. So let's say uh, somebody give me a nice, beautiful spring bird that you might be chasing in your neck of the woods. How about a prothonotary warbler? Do they live near you? Goldfinch, bluebirds. We're gonna go with bluebirds, Eastern bluebirds. So let's say you, you're thinking to yourself, I really, tomorrow, I really wanna photograph some bluebirds. A great resource is to go on this website called eBird. eBird, is a free resource. It's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I believe it's eBird.org. But if you Google eBird, you're going to find it. When you punch in a bird's name, you'll go into explore and then you'll do explore species and you'll type in the bird's name that you're after. This is from Australia, so don't worry about that. But what you're going to see is a map and it's going to show you all these little blue pins of everywhere that people have seen eastern bluebirds, which I imagine in your area would be a lot of pins. But you can sort it by years, maybe just this year or the last three years or whatever. The red pins are ones that people have seen in the last, I think it's like two weeks. So right away, you might get a good idea about where you might want to go looking for bluebirds. You don't want to waste your time in some place that they don't live anywhere near there. You want to go where they actually live. So eBird, great resource to put you on track to find your birds. The next thing we need to do although bluebirds is perhaps not a great example because you'd probably be photographing them near their nesting boxes. But for most birds, the next thing we're gonna to need to do is we need to learn the birds' calls. It is so much easier to find birds by their calls than it is by seeing them. You can hear in three dimensions. You can hear through foliage. You can hear behind you, you can hear in front of you. You can hear when it's dark. 
it is way easier to find birds from hearing them. But you have to know who you're listening for. So since we're just looking for one bird, one type of bird today, we can definitely learn one bird's call before we go out, right? I'm not saying learn every bird's call, just learn one. You're after one type of bird, learn that guy's call. And probably most of you have a smartphone. You could download one of the various birding apps and those will have sounds you can listen to. Or if you don't wanna do that or you don't have a smartphone, you could get a CD set of bird calls from the library, hire that out and listen to them. Or this is a website called Zeno Canto. Again, if you Google that, it'll take you there. And it has millions of bird calls that you can just type in the species name and you can listen to them, you can download them. It's a great place to learn your bird calls. So now we know where the bird lives. We know what he sounds like. We're almost ready to get out there. But what we need to do if we're gonna go out tomorrow is we need to get all of our equipment ready tonight. We are not gonna be looking around for our tripod in the morning. We're not gonna forget to charge our batteries. We're getting everything ready the night before. We're laying it out by the door, make our lunch, bottle of water, everything's ready to go. So that we can just get up early, get out the door and get on site early. What do I mean by early? I mean, we wanna be out there before it's shooting light. So. We don't wanna be there when the light is already great. We wanna be there at least half an hour before that. For two reasons. One, we won't be in a rush. We can actually get ourselves properly set up. And two, when do birds sing the most? First thing in the morning, before it's shooting light. So that's when you're gonna hear your bird. Remember, you know his call now. So you can get your gear ready, start walking around. Hopefully you're gonna hear your bird. You're gonna figure out where he lives. A lot, a lot, a lot of these birds, these migratory birds that are coming back to your neck of the woods right now, they all are gonna be coming back to a territory. Most likely their territory might only be like 400 meters or a quarter of a mile, uh, you know, circumference or whatever. So once you hear them in one area, that's probably where they're gonna stay in that little area. So listen for them, find them. Now the light's starting to come up and get nice, you're ready. Then what I said here, make the magic happen. Now, of course, it's different for every type of bird, right? What are we trying to photograph? Eastern bluebird. Okay. Eastern bluebird, your best chance is going to be probably at a nest box. First thing we need to know, is this an ethical thing to do? If the birds are just setting up on the nest box, not a good idea. You might flush them off and that would not be fair to the birds at all. However, if the birds are already feeding young at their nest box, they're very, very high sight fidelity at that point. You're probably not gonna flush them. Maybe you can use your car as a blind and you sit in your car and take some pictures of them um, or hide behind the car. You can certainly minimize your impact and get a few shots in that way. Maybe you can set up a few perches on the adjacent posts or something like that that they'll probably land in on their way to the nest box. It's just one example, given that was the bird we chose. If it's a little duck, maybe we're gonna try to figure out a pond that he's swimming in and Maybe it's at a local golf course where people feed them. We might throw some bird seed out, they come over. Maybe it's a brown creeper that we're after. And we know, since we know a lot about birds, that brown creepers usually go up the trunk in a spiral and then they fly to the next tree down low and then they go up again. So we see the brown creeper halfway up the tree. We're not gonna worry about him there. We're gonna move to the next tree, cross our fingers and hope he comes down to the bottom, take his shot. My point is the more you spend time in the field, you learn about birds and you learn about their behavior and then you can start to put that into the context and perspective so that you can have a better chance at getting a good photo. I can't tell you every single bird what the right technique is, but the more time you spend in the field and the more you study birds, you're gonna learn all these things. So that's a great way to prepare just to go photograph a bird tomorrow morning or next week. Now for me, I'll typically, Sadly, not in the last 16 months, but normally I go on a lot of photo shoots internationally. And if I'm gonna go to Ecuador for a month or two or six, like I have, I need to do a lot more research than just what I've described to you, of course, right? Because when I get down there, I might be off in the jungle for a month and I might have no internet. In fact, I hope I don't have internet. It's nice to be away from internet for a while but I certainly need to do some research before I go. So when I'm going on a big shoot, I start months in advance. First thing, obviously I'm gonna get the field guide. If 
I know you can't see behind me right now, but when I turn this screen share off, you'll see a big bookshelf and it's all books about birds. It's all field guides. I need to learn my birds. And one of the things I always do is I make like a research document for each trip. This website here, Cloud Birders, is amazing. Cloud Birders looks kind of like this. Again, I've put in Australia here. Cloud Birders is a site that has tons of trip reports from people who have done trips to wherever you're searching for. So let's just use, let's use Australia as an example. Let's say, Connie, once COVID is over, you're going to Australia and you want to plan a great trip. So first of all, let's look at this. Let's look at the bar graph. When are we going to go, Connie? This is the number of trip reports that people have posted in a month, in a given month. And clearly we can see that most people go in October. So Connie, I don't want you to book your flight for April or May. That is the fall down there. That's the autumn. The birds are going to look all ratty. They've just come out of molting. They're not singing. You don't want to go then. You want to go in October. Spring, beautiful, singing. So right away, we've got some great information. Then we can start looking at what part of Australia we're gonna to go to. We can download all these trip reports, totally free. They're probably gonna be PDF files, just download them, read them, start planning your trip. What birds do I really wanna see? What parts of the country do I really wanna visit? Maybe there's a, a park you really wanna to go to. Those are the kind of things that I'm, I, I usually download them, I print them, I get my highlighters out and I start to plan my trip. What I do is I make, a a research document. It'll ultimately be like a spiral bound little document that I can bring with me on my trip. And each site that I'm going to visit will have a couple of pages. So here, for example, this is just a page I pulled out of one from, from a trip I did to Colombia. So I've put kind of a little summary, my top sort of 10 target birds at this site that I want to hope to see. And then some of the main features like they're feeding ant pittas, they've got some hummingbird feeders, some people have spotted some owls at night, and then some information about particular birds that have been seen on particular trails. So now when I'm down there, if I don't have internet, at least I've got something that I can reference off of and I can make a bit of a plan for how to go about my day's shoot. And then basically, once we're actually there, once Connie's in Australia or I'm in Colombia, we just do things just like we did for a normal day's shoot. We pick a couple birds, one or two birds, we figure out where they're likely to be found. We listen to their calls. We try to learn their calls. We get everything ready. We get out there early. We make the magic happen. So this might sound really obvious, but ask yourself, do you do this kind of preparation when you're trying to photograph birds? Maybe yes, maybe no. But I promise you that if you try this this spring, you're gonna have good results. So give this a try. This is a, a little bit rep, repetition here, but um, an average day in the field, just to hammer the point home. We're on location at first light, or of course, if it's an afternoon shoot, we're getting out there before the light is, is really ideal. We're focused on one target. We're guided by our ears. We really wanna use our ears. We're always looking for patterns and gathering information. And another point that I could have put in here is, we're target focused, we're looking for our bluebird, but if some spectacular rare bird comes flying in, it's not like we're just gonna not look at him and take his picture, of course we are. We're always looking for great opportunities, but we're not distracted by every single bird that might be tweeting in the forest. We're, we're typically pretty focused, but we're also open to opportunities as they present themselves. And then remember, if the light is no good, if it's gotten too dark, if the light is too harsh, remember our shadow trick, pack it up, go get a, take a break, go have lunch, try again in the afternoon, try again the next day. You know, don't force the issue if the light and the conditions aren't there for you. You're not going to get a great photo if the conditions aren't appropriate. Another thing, I put this in here because I, you know, I've spent thousands of hours in the field with bird photographers teaching them. And I noticed something that bird photographers like a lot of equipment. They like to go to B&H Photo Video and buy everything that's available and they like to bring it all. So that might sound nice to have all those toys, but you don't wanna be like this guy. This guy is not gonna be a successful bird photographer. He's got too much stuff 
And really, he's just burdened by his equipment. For me, part of simplifying that field aspect of photography is just bringing what I need. Everything's organized and everything is just where I need it. And for me, it's all about the fanny pack. It's not just a wonderful fashion accessory. For me, this is typical in the field. My camera is on my tripod and it's already up at my eye height. I got my binoculars, of course, and I've got my fanny pack that has everything else I needed. I've got my memory cards, I've got extra batteries. If I'm not using my flash, it might be in there. Teleconverter, maybe some bug spray, whatever I need, it's in there and it's right where I need it. So if I need a battery, there we go, here it is. Everything's organized and I don't wanna lug around more stuff than I need. So just something to consider. Another thing that's worth considering is just having realistic goals. I think sometimes people would come to like a talk like this maybe, or they look at my website or they go on Instagram and they think, oh yeah, birds, I'd like to photograph them. And then they go out and of course they don't realize how hard it is. They don't get any great shots and they get super discouraged. So I like to tell people, if every time you go out, you come home with one good image, you're doing great. That's certainly my goal. I went out shooting this morning. I think I got one really nice photo and I'm happy. I don't need to get dozens of great images every time I go out. Sometimes you do, sometimes every, luck is on your side. But, and a lot of times I go out and I'm sure you do as well and you don't get any great shots. That happens, you know, birds are not that easy to photograph. But if you just keep in mind this one good image per shoot, I think that's a great target. However, maybe you've got a bird feeder in your backyard and you've seen this presentation talking about seven elements of a great bird photograph. So you've set up a beautiful perch, the light is right, everything is magical. On that particular day, you're probably gonna get more than one really good photo. So whenever you can and everything's working for you, remember those seven elements and take the time to set it all up and do things the right way. Okay, our next thing we're going to talk quickly about is just this idea of building a portfolio. We kind of talked about it already. Like, for example, I love, you know, nice clean images with green backgrounds. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't want all of my photos to be like that. Now, that's just me, of course. I'm not saying that's the right approach. Maybe you think that is, that's all you want to take, and that's fine. But it is important that you consider what are you trying to create, because they're your photos. Now, maybe you don't know because you're just not sure yet. So I think a really good thing to do is to study lots of photos. So they could be on the internet, Flickr, or Instagram, or Facebook, other members of your camera club. Maybe you get a bunch of coffee table books about birds from the library and look at lots of photos and decide what you like. And then you can kind of do what I, as I've described and you kind of deconstruct the photos. And well, how did Glenn take that nice loon photo there? It sure looks like he was low down in the water. He must have been on his belly, or maybe he was in the water. You get the idea. You kind of start to think about how the photos were taken based on your technical knowledge of photography. And then when you're actually out in the field, you can start to visualize what do you like? What are you trying to create? And how will you do it? Instead of just, oh, there's a bird. Click. That's, that's not great. Don't do that. For me, when I go on a photo expedition, I want to photograph lots of different types of birds. I'm a naturalist at heart. I'm a, I'm a birder. I love seeing all the beautiful different birds. So I want to try to photograph as many as possible. But I also want, ideally, to have some different styles of images. And this is what I think of as the book factor. For me, as a professional wildlife photographer, there's nothing greater as a career achievement than publishing a coffee table book with a big major publisher that hopefully thousands and thousands of people will buy and have on their coffee table. It'd be a pretty boring book if all we saw was bird on a stick with the green background, page after page after page after page, wouldn't it? So for me, when I'm thinking about a portfolio, I'm always trying to think of like, we want some action shots, we want some dynamic shots, we want some tight portraits, we want a bit of variety. And right now, as I mentioned, I'm working on this Hummingbirds book, and not only do I want variety in the photos, but I've really, I've, I've contracted a, a, a wonderful illustrator from, uh, from the Netherlands, and she's doing these beautiful black and white pen and ink illustrations 
to mix in with the book to break up that you know while the hummingbirds are beautiful and colorful and then every once in a while it's nice to have a break from that and have a beautiful illustration that's black and white and then maybe on the next page there's a cool map and then the next page is a neat little chart or figure to me that's what makes an interesting book is that you never know what's on the next page so think about that also in your own portfolio just something to consider okay let's move into the digital darkroom we're not going to spend that much time in here because again it's already a an hour and a bit into the talk, but let's talk a little bit about the digital darkroom. Once again, we want to keep it simple. But before we get into the exciting world of Photoshop, it's really important that we all calibrate our monitors, whether we're using a laptop or more ideally a, a nice quality monitor, we have to calibrate the screen. And in order to do that, we need a device such as this one. This is an old one, but we need some type of calibration device that we kind of stick on the monitor. It's gonna come with some software. It's gonna run through a whole bunch of shades and colors, and it's gonna create what's called an ICC profile. That tells your computer how to display colors accurately on your screen. This is so important that we do this. Otherwise, you know, if I send you a photo and it looks perfect to me, but you haven't calibrated your screen or I haven't calibrated my screen, it might look totally different to you or the photo lab or National Geographic. We have to have some standard. And so in order to do that, you have to calibrate your screen. These days, so my new camera is the Canon R5. Today I was doing flight shooting. The R5 can shoot 20 frames a second. I took a lot of photos this morning. I don't wanna keep all those photos. In fact, I took 1500 shots. I kept 12. We have to have a good program in order to do that. So like I said here, call like crazy. When I'm on my photo tours, I always tell people after dinner or whatever, go delete a bunch of photos. What I tell people is you should delete at least 90% of the photos you take. I probably delete 99% of the photos I take. I only want the best ones, but that can be a pretty agonizing process if you don't have a good program. If you are with the PC platform, I highly recommend downloading the free trial, at least, of a program called Breeze Browser. Unfortunately, it's not available for Mac, um, and I don't have a great Mac alternative for you, but Breeze Browser looks like this. The thing that makes it amazing, it's so fast to load the images up, and what's even better is after you've kind of gone through it and gotten rid of all the obvious bad ones, you can zoom in instantly on four at a time. And then, even though I thought all these four were pretty good, when I zoomed in on them, I think maybe I'll only keep the top right. I'll delete the other three and move on to the next selection of four more and keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And it really whittles it down to just your best work. So it's a great, great program for culling. Next up, we need to convert our raw files. And throughout our Photoshop or our digital darkroom journey, we always wanna keep two concepts in mind. One is we wanna be proficient. We want our photos to look beautiful, but we also want to be efficient. We don't want to waste time in the digital darkroom. And there's a lot of little things we can do that starts to add up, especially if we're processing hundreds or thousands of photos a year, which most, like I certainly am. When it comes to processing our raw files, the last thing that we want to do is open up one raw file, make all our little changes, exposure, highlights, whites, blacks, shadows, saturation, go into Photoshop, do what we're gonna do, then come back out, open up another new raw file, do the same thing all over again. No. If you've been out shooting this morning, your Eastern Bluebirds, you took a thousand photos, you deleted 90%, you deleted 95%, you went crazy. You got it down to 50 photos. You're gonna open all 50 raw photos at once. Probably you were shooting in very similar light, the same bird, maybe even the same perch. You're gonna process that first raw file. Make all your changes just like you normally would. Then you're gonna take those settings, you're gonna sync those settings to the other 49 files. Boom, done. Or actually I shouldn't have said done. You're still gonna have a quick peek at the other 49, but most likely you've just gotten 90% of the way there. Maybe a cloud came and you have to tweak something, but 
a lot, a lot, a lot of the times, like for me, when I was processing those teals from this morning, all I had to do was dial in the settings for the first one. Nothing changed for the other 10 that I kept or whatever it was. All I needed to do was dial in my settings on the first file, sync those to the other ones, and I can move on into Photoshop. So do not process one raw file at a time. That is a huge, huge waste of time. Next up, we need to establish what I would call a basic workflow in Photoshop. Now, this is a set of steps that we're probably going to do to like every image. So for me, I typically will reduce the noise on the background. I will check in with levels. I will adjust shadows and highlights, saturation and contrast, and then I'll save the file. And that's my basic workflow. Rather than have to do this step by step by step over and over and over again, I write all of that into what's called an action. An action is like a little recipe. You write it, you record it once, and then you can apply it to the every file thereafter. But it's not automatically applying those settings. It still lets you slide your sliders and make your changes. It just brings up the, the next tool automatically. So it really saves you time and it keeps you on track when you're processing. So you really want to learn how to use actions. And then we can, of course, move on from there to specific concerns. You know, maybe we want to clone a little branch out of the background or remove a bit of dirt from the bird's bill. You know, the sky's the limit in Photoshop. You can literally do anything in Photoshop if you want to. Or you could just convert your raw file and save it and call it a day there. That's fine too. There's a spectrum of processing from basic adjustments to very, very complicated things. And I'm not telling you where you should fall on that spectrum, but it's at least good to have some good resources to learn how to do these things if you should want to. So for example, in this image, this is a hooded mountain tanager, and it's a beautiful bird. It's a really awesome perch, but unfortunately he had this thing in front of his tail and this really ugly dead orchid flower sticking out behind his head. Now for me, I much prefer the lower image. I don't want those things distracting me from the photo. So I removed them because I know how to do that. I'm not saying that you should do that or that you should do whatever you want to your photos. But for me, I prefer the lower image and I would like to be able to do that to my images if they need that. So that's how I approach it. A little commercial break. If you are interested in learning more about Photoshop, from a nature photography perspective and you want to learn how to use actions and layer masks and all this exciting stuff, you might want to check out this ebook that I've written. It's called Post-Processing Simplified, a Guide for Nature Photographers. And I'll show you where you can find that at the end of the talk. It's going to walk you through everything from calibrating your monitor to basic workflow, raw processing, to much more advanced stuff, layer masking, making selections, cloning. You can download my actions. You can watch little video tutorials. It's very comprehensive. So like I said, I'll show you that at the end. And if you like that, you might also enjoy these other guides called Process With Me. In those, you download three of my photos to your computer, and then you watch a video and we process it together. So you have the file, I have the file, you watch as I process along. And it's, it's just another different way to learn. We all learn differently. It's nice to have some different options. So. I'll show you where you can find those at the end of the talk. I put this in here because I first gave this talk at a, a conference in Australia where we weren't talking to a camera club. And I thought it's really important about everybody sharing your work because I always think, what good are all these amazing photos if they're just sitting on my hard drive and nobody ever sees them? I know you guys know this because you're members of a camera club and I know you share your work with each other. But it's just good to remember, it's always nice to share them because not everybody is as lucky as us to get to go out into nature, explore, see these beautiful birds and find some way to share them. If it's your camera club, if it's Flickr or Instagram, emailing, there's lots of ways, but it's worth doing. And then our second to last slide is all about equipment. Of course, it's nice to have a big super telephoto lens. This is a 600 millimeter F4. It's very helpful. However, it's also very heavy. And if you have a big lens, you probably need a big sturdy tripod and then you need a good tripod head and it just keeps getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So I wouldn't recommend buying this if you don't think you can carry it around and enjoy yourself in the field. It's nice to have a big lens, but you don't wanna not be mobile. If you get a big lens, you need a good tripod. 
Flash can be useful, but is by no means mandatory. And in fact, if you're just getting into bird photography, I probably wouldn't even mess with flash for at least a year. Don't even bother. The most important thing you can do, the most important thing you can purchase, the most important thing you can do for your own advancement in bird photography is get a nice pair of binoculars and a field guide. Spend some time out in nature. If it's allowed or when it's allowed, join your local natural history group. Maybe they have a birders, maybe a, a what do you call it? Um, my mind's going blank. The local conservation group, the uh, Audubon Society perhaps, has a birding wing near you. Go out with the birders, leave your camera at home, learn about birds, and you're gonna, that's gonna help you to take better pictures of birds. Go out with some birders and learn three bird calls. And then do the things I told you about trying to find the birds based on their calls. This is the most important thing. Once you learn about birds, you realize how you can get close to them. You can, like for example, shorebirds will allow you to get super close if you get down low, if you sneak up to them. Or for example, if I was trying to photograph some shorebirds and they were walking along the shore over here, the last thing I'm gonna do is walk towards the birds. I'm gonna scare them away. Clearly that's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna see that they're feeding in this direction. They're going from over there to over here. So I'm gonna go where they're going slowly lay down on the beach and I'm going to wait and they're going to walk right in front of me. I've had shorebirds walk into my lens hood, inside of my lens hood while I was trying to photograph. Them. Once you're laying on the ground, they don't see you as a threat at all. In fact, you're just a blob or a log or a rock. They don't perceive you as any threat. So the point is you don't need this massive lens to take nice pictures of birds. It's helpful, but if you learn about the birds, you can open up a whole bunch of opportunities to, to go out and photograph them, even if you don't have you know, crazy bird photography equipment. So that brings us to the end of tonight's talk. So I wanna thank you guys for having me. And if you want to see more of my photos, that's my website, it's just my name. Um, so that's easy to find. And like I said, the eBooks uh, you'll find on my website um, at the top, there's a tab called Books. And that's where you're going to find all my different ebooks about Photoshop, about Flash, about a lot of other things. Uh, what else? If you want to know about equipment, there's a tab called Gear. If you want to just see some more photos, you can check out the What's New section. Uh, if you think of something after the fact, you can find my contact info under the About section. I'm not normally I do all these photo tours, like I said, but unfortunately, I'm I'm still not quite ready to start leading those again with the whole COVID situation. But hopefully next year we'll get back in action. Um, so if you're interested in learning about um, exciting birds and, and want to do that with um, someone who's passionate about it and who could, you know, hopefully teach you a few things about birds and bird photography, you could check out the workshops tab. So that's about all I have to say. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We could probably unmute everybody now. <laughs> it was a quiet group tonight, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Hopefully everybody picked up at least some yeah. little tidbit of information that they can apply to their photography, whether it's birds or chipmunks or squirrels, whatever we're photographing over there. Is there a minimum length lens that you would recommend? Yeah, I think, okay, so when I got started, I bought a film camera back in the day and I had a, a 100 to 300 millimeter zoom. And of course, with a full frame film camera, 300 millimeters was the absolute minimum. And I think that's too short, really. Um, once I got a bit, a 300 millimeter F4 and I could use a 1.4 times converter on it and I was using a crop body. So that was magnified again, effective focal length. I think, I think you want your effective focal length to be at least 500 millimeters. So either you get one of those sort of super zooms that's like a, you know 200 to 600 or something like that, or you get maybe a 300 F4 with the teleconverter on a crop body, um, something that gets you effectively up to about 500, that will get you, that will get you going. Yeah, I have a 200 to 500 and I yeah. use it on a crop sensor body for an effective 750. Perfect. But that's, that thing is heavy. 
Yes, yes, yeah. I carried it around all day. No tripod at a very large zoo. And yeah, I, I probably needed a chiropractor by the well, end of the yeah, day. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it, it has to be considered because you don't want to do yourself in. You want to enjoy the experience. Um, so then you want to think about like some kind of camera harness or something. There's a really cool one from a company called Cotton Carrier that it's like a chest harness that it sort of clicks into. That way you can, when you're not using it, you don't have to be lugging it around and it's not towing you in one direction. So yeah, but yeah, there's no, like I said, there's no way to sugarcoat it. The big lenses are heavy. I was shoot, I was hand holding my 600 today and yeah, my bicep's going to be burnt out probably, but hey, you do what you got to do. I see some chat questions here, so I'm going to try to address those. What is your usual shutter speed? So again, there's no usual shutter speed. It, that is absolutely, there's no set it and forget it settings when it comes to bird photography. What you want to ask yourself is what am I trying to photograph? What is my movement? What is its movement? What type of shutter speed do I need in order to capture that motion and create a sharp photo? So it all depends. What ISO is your maximum? Well, that is changing by the minute with these new cameras. I just got the Canon R5 and it is shockingly good at higher ISOs. So my old 7D Mark II, I would be very reluctant to shoot even 3200 and certainly above that is unusable. I have taken shots with the R5 at ISO 25,600 which are very usable. I wouldn't want to use it all the time, but I I processed up one from 12,800 and it's very, very, very good. So the technology is getting quite amazing. Is there a maximum focal length you would suggest stopping at? So I would say the biggest you can carry. Um, there's no point in my opinion of getting an 800 millimeter, the, the 800 F5.6. Um, because you've lost that stop. So the 800.5.6 is the exact same as a 600 f4 with a 1.4 converter. However, it has a, a, a further uh, minimum focus distance. So to me, there's absolutely no advantage to that lens. So to me, the, the, the pinnacle, the best bird photography lens, if you have a Sherpa who's going to carry it around for you, is a 600 f4. Um, so I think I've okay. handled all the chat questions. Prime or Zoom? It, definitely Prime if you can carry it. Um, although the Zooms are getting really good, like the new, again, I'm talking Canon and I apologize for the Sony and Nikon people, but it's just because that's what I shoot with. It's not because that's what I think is better. But um, the in the Canon lineup, the 100 to 400 Zoom is an amazing lens that I've been using. And now they have this new RF mount 100 to 500, which is by all accounts, an incredible lens. Um, so some of the zooms are very good. However, they don't take teleconverters very well. So like I was shooting today, those, those uh, teals with my 600 with a two times converter on it. So I was at 1200 millimeters and I was shooting full frame because um, my camera, I could switch it into crop mode, but there's really no advantage to that because the bird is so fast, I'm just gonna be cutting his wings off and stuff. So um, the primes allow you to use teleconverters and extend your range out. Whereas a zoom, you're kind of limited to that zoom. So mm -hmm. I'll just say this, as far as equipment, money's no object, you're super jacked, 600 F4 and a, and a nice zoom lens, like a 100 to 400 or 100 to 500 or 200 to 500. Perfect. If you have those two, you're all set. I was intrigued when you said you use a, a fanny pack. With my shoulders, uh, I have a hard time with backpacks putting them yeah. off. And I, you know, have a messenger type bag, which is always a pain. So I was intrigued when you said you use a fanny pack. Uh, yeah. You, you get everything you need into, for a day shoot in that. Yeah, I find I do. I mean, sometimes I'll, if I'm going to hike more of a distance and I need like, you know, maybe like a rain jacket and an extra bottle of water and some food and stuff like that, then I might chuck on a very light backpack. But normally when I'm in the field for like a, like a, a session, like a morning or an afternoon, yeah, that's typical that I would just have that stuff um, in a fanny pack. And you might be interested in that cotton carrier. I think I have a link to it in my gear page because it, it will put the weight very balanced on your shoulders. And then between that, being able to to take the rig off of your hands 
and then a fanny pack you, that might be more comfortable for you. Do you have any brands that you look at when you look at fanny packs and such or just um, usual? <laughs> a, a nice big one. Um, mine is actually the top compartment of my low pro backpack. The top compartment comes off and it's a great size one. So that's what I use. But you could go to any hiking store. You probably want one that has a couple of compartments and pretty large. But you just need to go to like an out, like go to REI or somewhere and see what they have. There are fanny packs that even have like water bottle holders in them. And another suggestion, Jeff, is like a backpack that has a good hip belt with pockets on the hip belt because that does help distribute the weight off of your shoulders. Yeah, it's, it's not so much the weight on my shoulders is getting your arms into the straps and around, yeah. or, you know. The old rotor cuff injuries uh, <laughs> have taken their toll, carrying around yeah. too much lumber. <laughs> yeah, I found some really cool fanny packs that actually have like water bottle holders in them. Yeah, and if you're, if you're using like, if you're bringing like a wide angle or something, you could even tuck another lens in the water bottle holder like that. Um, what I do, again, I feel like I'm really pumping this cotton carrier. I'm not like sponsored or affiliated with them in any way, but I, they have these, um, attachment things. It's like a kind of rigid plate that you can slide like the strap of your backpack or in my case fanny pack through and then it has their like proprietary attachment thing. So for example on my binoculars I have that attachment thing so I can click it into my cotton carrier on my hip belt as well or other accessories. They have like one that's velcroable so you could like have it literally on another lens. Anyways some there's lots of options the main thing is to, um, the point is don't bring more stuff than you need. Try to make yourself as comfortable as you can be in the field. And that way you'll enjoy your time out there a lot more, which is kind of what it's all about. So I don't know if anyone has any more questions. I know you guys have more club meeting, club meeting business to get to. So if no one has any other questions, I may sign off. And if anyone thinks of something this evening, you've got my email or my website. You can find my email on there and I'm happy to answer any questions if you shoot me an email.